Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the house of the Lord today. We appreciate your presence. I appreciate you that's tuned in out in the radio listening audience. We're hoping today we can be an inspiration to everyone that's listening in the radio listening audience as well as you here in the auditorium. You know the weather's been somewhat bad here around Athens in the last few hours, but we appreciate you that's come on to the house of God to worship the Lord in spite of the bad weather, so we appreciate your presence. Now this is Preach Edward speaking. We're hoping today we can be a blessing to you here and you in the uh, radio listen audience. Now I want you to take your Bible and turn, will you please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 9. While you're turning there, I'd like to say that we do have the singing and the message on cassette tape. And they're available. Now these tape we'll send out to you for a gift of $3 of each tape and the gift is used to help pay for radio time. My mail has been greatly off in the past two weeks. I'm in need of hearing from you, the listener. And when you write, why not request some tape and get them? That can be a blessing to you. Now this tape today is tape number 137. Tape number 137. Now you write in and request the tape. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is a zip code number. About three weeks ago, we received our new brochures for our proposed Holy Land tour for 1985. The Lord willing, I say the Lord willing, we plan to make this tour in March of next year. It'll be tour number 12 for me if, if I go on the tour, which I do plan unless God leads otherwise. And we'd like to be your tour host. And if you'd like to find out more information about the tour, then write in and let me send you a brochure. It tells you the time we leave, how long we'll be gone, where we'll be going. It's a wonderful, wonderful tour. We go to Jordan. We go to Masada. We go to Israel. We go to Egypt. And I won't take time to mention the wonderful places we'll be covering on the tour, but I will send you a brochure. There may be some of you listening today, your pastor's never been. You might want to send your pastor, your pastor and his wife. You might want to send a friend. You might want to go yourself. It'd be a real trip of a lifetime. We've seen God bless and do wonders through these trips. A few years ago, we had a young couple to go with us on the tour. And this young man surrendered to preach, and he's finished Bob Jones University now and passed in the church. And you see what God does through trips like this. And that's why we go year after year, because of the good that can be done through these tours. And, of course, this is a dimension of our ministry. And we always look forward to people going because it can be such a blessing to them. Now, you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, all you've heard, uh, not all you've heard, but you've heard much here recently about the Olympics that had the beginning on yesterday out in uh, California. And it's been talked about all over the nation, talked about all over the world. And these people come from all over the world to show forth their ability, their talents, and they're coming to try to win uh, honor out there. They're running for a gold medal. And all of them are trying to win a gold medal. That's their aim. If they could just win a gold medal. And they look forward to it. And they train for this for years. I think the Olympics are about four years apart. And they train the full four years. And they train hard and vigorous to go out there and win a gold medal. But did you know God's people can also win a gold medal as it were? And I want to speak to you today on that line of thought. Go for the gold. Now you need to go for the gold. Now the Bible tells us that on the Sabbath day, it was a custom of the Lord Jesus to go into the synagogue. It's always a custom of the apostles and disciples to go and worship in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And then when the Sabbath changed to the first day of the week, it was always their custom to meet on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. And then Paul warns us in the book of Hebrews, he said, as we move toward the end, then don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. He said, don't forget to go to church, and more so, 
as we move on toward the end. You know, God appreciates people that honor his house and honor him enough to come to God's house on the Lord's day. It ought to be a custom. Since God saved me more than 40 years ago, I never fail to be in God's house on Sunday unless I'm sick. I've only been sick maybe once or twice, maybe not more than one time since that time to keep me out of the house of God on the Lord's day. We need to be in God's house on the Lord's day. Now you have a lot of born again believers, they take the house of God too lightly. They're at home this morning, some of them still in bed, some of them sitting around there in the homes, and they know good and well they could be in God's house. They know that, they have no excuse. Now do you think God is pleased with that? Do you think the Lord is going to let you get by with that? Now you can ignore God's house like a freight train passing up a tramp. But remember God knows where you live, He knows your number. And one of these days, he may call your number. And when he does, it'll be too late then to do anything about it. Now, you can't ignore God's house, ignore God's people, ignore your pastor in coming to hear him get the message he has for you and think that God's going to wink at that and look over that. God is not. If you're a born-again believer, God's going to hold you accountable. You may say, now, preach Evans, I've done it a lot of times and everything's going along well. Remember the mills of God grind slowly, but they grind. And God just don't forget these things. And that's coming a reminder. And you must keep that in mind. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning with verse 11. But the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Now Paul is talking about running a race. Now those people out in California... They are paid a tremendous price physically and financially and every way to gain this honor to win a gold medal. Now Paul said we are running a race that's far more important than that. And he said we could win a gold medal for God. In verse 24 of 1 Corinthians 9, Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receive the prize, so run that you may obtain. Now Paul said, every man that striveth the master is tempted in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertain as so far, I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it in subjection, lest that by any means when I preach as I myself should be a castaway. Now Paul is telling us here we need to run that we might receive the gold medal, as it were, when we come to the end of life's journey. The people the world over are interested in gold, whether they're going to the Olympics or whatnot, they're interested in gold, and so is God. God is concerned about a natural gold. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, the name of the first is Pison, that is, which compass the whole land of Hevelah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Now, back in the very beginning, we find in the Bible that God mentioned the gold of that particular era where Adam lived. And God said that gold was good. Now Adam said it was good. Now God uh, cherishes gold. There's something about gold that's very precious and unique. And, and God made mention of the gold in that day. King Solomon drank gold out of golden vessels. In Revelation we have candlesticks of gold. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12 I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. In verse 20 of Revelation 1, and the seven candlesticks I saw, which I saw are the seven churches. And God is saying here then, the gold is in the church. You want to know where the gold is? It's in the church, he says here. And God said the capital city of heaven is gold. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 12, the building of the walls are jasper and the city was pure gold like clear glass. God said the gold was his. In Haggai chapter 2 and verse 8, The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. So we're running a race for gold. God is concerned about gold, and God will determine our rewards upon whether we build upon gold, silver, or precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. Now let's notice how the race is to be run the beginning of the race and the qualification for the race as we run for the goal. Number one, notice the origin of the race. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1, 
Wherefore, seeing we also are accomplished about so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, the Bible tells us here that God himself set this race before us. When God saved you, then God set a race out there before you, and God expects you to run that race. Every true born-again believer has a race to run. Now there's a lot of God's children that's fallen by the wayside and given up on the race. There's some are falling out. There's some have allowed others to knock them out. But there's some still on that racetrack. And you started that race when God saved you and God set that race out there. That race is not of your own choosing. When God saved me back down to more than 40 years ago, God set a race out there for me to run. And for more than 40 years, I've been on this racetrack. I will not let anyone sidetrack me or stop me on this racetrack. I'm going to run for the goal and run to the end. And that's exactly what God wants you to do. He set the race out there, not you. God set the track for you. You didn't choose it for yourself. God set it for you. And God wants you to keep on running and keep on running and not give up. Not become discouraged. Don't let anyone deviate you from the racetrack. Stay on the track and keep moving on for God is set before us. Number two, I want you to notice the opportunity of this race. In John chapter 15 and verse 16, says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. God gave you the opportunity to run this race for him. There's millions out there living for the devil that's not on this racetrack. But you're on the track today if you're saved and God chose you for this race. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all men as we run this race. So God placed you on the racetrack. God set the racetrack out for you, chose you, set you on the track, and now it's up to you to run this race until you come to the end of life's journey. God wants you to do so. That's your privilege, your opportunity. And God expects you to do so. And we thank God for the race runners. I know we have some that's given up. As some that's thrown in the towel, so to speak. Some have been kicked off the racetrack by others. Some allowed the devil to put stumbling blocks out there and stop them. But there's some of them, in spite of the obstacles, still running for God. They're after that goal, and that's what God wants them to be after. God wants you to run for the goal. Out yonder for the next few weeks in um, California, if you look at the news on TV, you're going to see scene after scene after scene of people running, jumping, swimming, boxing, fighting, playing all kind of games. And they be doing that for goal. And if you're a Christian, you ought to say, yes, they out there running for gold that'll perish. But I'm on a racetrack running for gold that'll never perish. And you ought to thank God for that. And then notice number three, the operator of the race. Now, somebody is operator in charge of the race. Out there in California, they have a man that's in charge of that. I saw him interview him on the news. He's in charge of the Olympics out there. Been working on it for four years. He's in full charge. He was a man to say who was going to bring the torch into the arena. They've been running with that torch all over this nation from the east to the west. They've carried that torch. If you have a TV set and you see it on the news, you see them running with that torch. This man in charge will have the honor of saying who will take the last step with that torch and set it up. All of this had its beginning back down with Greece hundreds and hundreds of years ago. They were great runners and they ran with torches and they ran the race. And so there's an operator of the race and he has his hand on everything and he operates it. He's a coach if you please. Now we have an operator. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 25, See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refuse him that spoke on the earth, much more, how much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? Now Jesus Christ is the coach. He's our captain. He is the operator. The Lord is operating you on this racetrack. He set it out for you. He chose you. He placed you on the track. And now he's the operator. And you must run according to his rules. Now, if you ever look at sports, you notice the um, manager or the coach or whatnot. 
They're in charge of the team. They're responsible for that team. They put in their players. They take out the players. They are so responsible for what's going on in that game. Now we have a coach and this coach is none other than Jesus Christ. He's the operator. He's the coach. And he set us on the track. Now we got to run the race like he said run it. If you don't run the race like God said run it. You're not going to get that goal at the end of life's journey. You may say preach Evers, How may I know how to run this race? 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 says study. To show thyself approved unto God a workman. That needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's taken from the background in the original Greek of a carpenter that builds a house. And then he gets off and looks at that house. It's one-sided. Looks like it's about ready to fall in. The foundation is not solid. And he built that house, and he's a carpenter, and is ashamed of that house. Now, beloved, listen to me. God said, you that know him, study the Bible that you won't be ashamed of the race you're running. And be ashamed when you come to the end of life's journey. Now the man that built the house in which we now dwell. He built a good house. A brother Melvin Altry built a wonderful house that we're living in. Well built. Beautiful home. And he was very proud of that house. He built it. And a lot of people come by that, that pay us a visit always bragging on it. How well built it is. How beautiful it is. And it made him feel mighty good. He was the builder. He built the house. He was proud of it. Now I feel to build an old shabby house. If I read to fall in, then he'd been ashamed of it. Now God Almighty said, you that run this race, run it according to the scriptures and you won't be ashamed. Number four, that's the outfitting for the race. Now those people in California that's running or swimming or whatever they're doing, they'll have on the uniform of the suit for the occasion. They know what they must wear. They know the kind of uniform, the suit they must have on that they might um, gain the goal. They know that. They have been outfitted. That's been tried and proven. Now God has you outfitted for the race. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also accomplish about so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. So you see, God wants us to take off, undo, or get away from the things that hinder the race we are running. Now, if you were going out here to run a foot race, you wouldn't put on overcoat. You wouldn't put on a heavy pair of boots. No, you want to run as light as possible. You want to run so you can really move. I remember when I was a little boy, Every spring of the year, we look forward to getting our shoes off. In fact, our parents had to almost whip us to make us keep them on when the weather got warm. But as soon as we could slip those shoes off, man, are you talking about a foot racing? We got out there, we would run a foot race, stump our toe, fall down. But we felt so light with them shoes off until we felt like we could just outrun our shatter almost. And we look forward to it. Now, you don't run a race loaded down. Neither does a Christian run a race for God all tied up and loaded down and weighted down with the cares of this world. In order to be your best and run your best for God, you've got to unload the things that hinder you. You've got to lay aside the weights that hold you down. And the Bible says lay aside that sin that does so easily beset you. That's your besetting sin. That's a sin that gives you more trouble than any other sin you're confronted with. Every Christian has a besetting sin. He might not want to tell you, she might not want to tell you what it is, but he knows and she knows what that besetting sin is. And Paul said in order to really run the race like we should, we've got to lay that one aside. Now you can rest assured the devil knows what it is, and that's why he keeps tempting you with that besetting sin, the one that hinders you the most. But the Bible said to run the race, gain the goal, to get the goal at the end of the journey, then you got to do something about that besetting sin. Lay it aside. And then we move to thought number five, and that's the obstacles. Not only are you outfitted for the race, but there's obstacles that you need to be concerned about. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15, the Bible says, Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man can see the Lord. Look in diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you and thereby be defiled. 
Now he mentioned one in particular, one obstacle that every child of God is confronted with sooner or later, sometimes more, some more often than others, and that is the root of bitterness. That is somebody has done you wrong. Somebody has misjudged you. Somebody has done something to you that's upset you, and you just can't seem to get rid of that bitterness. Now the devil knows that, and he's going to keep you embittered to keep you from running your race well. Now he knows if you're embittered toward someone that deep down in your heart there's revenge. And God said, vengeance is mine and I'll repay. God said, you don't have to get even with that person. If you get even with the person, you're standing on equal ground. Now he said, you don't have to get even with that person. God said, let me take care of that for you. And you turn that over to God and let God take care of it. He said, vengeance belongeth to him. He'll handle your case. And if somebody has abused you, Somebody has misjudged you. Somebody has talked about you, criticized you. Somebody said something against you. Then if that bitterness springs up in your heart, that's going to hinder that right. That's going to slow you down to a walk. You cannot run for God and hold bitterness in your heart against anyone. You can't do it. Oh, you may say, now preach preacher, you don't know just what that person's done to me. I may not know what the person's done to you, but I know a God whose grace is sufficient to help you swallow something bigger than you are. That's why the Bible says, be harmless as servants and wise as servants and harmless as a dove. A snake can fall an object, swallow an object bigger than it is. And God wants you to swallow that object bigger than you are by his help and grace and get that bitterness out of your heart and life or you'll never run the race and get the goal for God. That bitterness has got to go. I've known people that's mistreated me in my lifetime. I'm glad I can't get lost. Because I get lost, I'd beat the devil out of them and get saved again. But I'm glad I can't get lost. Therefore, I'm not going to beat the devil out of them. I'll let God take care of that. But I've had people so mistreat me, I could whip them and stomp them in the ground and never think anything about it. But I have to ask God to give me grace. I have to ask God to help me get that bitterness out, to help me to overcome it. And you'll have to do likewise. You really will. You have to do likewise if you expect to run that race. That, that, that obstacle is there. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 12, the Bible says, Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame um, be uh, moved out of the way and let it be healed. Now he tells us here the, the lame hands, the weak knees, the part of you that's weak and lame, you got to work on that. You may be strong in some phases of your life, but there's other phases you're weak. The weak need, the lame hands, that's what he said to work on. Take care of that. If you're going to run a race, you can't be crippled have a weak knee to do it. I've been a jogger. I've jogged for 30 years. And here some time ago, I overdid it and messed up my left knee. That just about fixed my jogging. I couldn't get out there and jog now like I used to because of that. I'm afraid I'd have the same trouble. It healed up, but I don't want it to give me more trouble. So I just get out and, and walk like the devil's after me instead of running. And I try to skip along a little too and get up a little speed that way because I've always jogged to try to stay healthy and keep my weight down. But that knee stopped me. Now, beloved, you can let things stop you and hinder you from your race. The love of money is the root of all evil. You can get so tied up and making money until you lose sight of God and everything else. And that's a sin. That's a wicked sin. The love of money is the root of all evil. And if a devil can get you to love money more than anything in the world, he's got you pretty well whipped and captured, and you're not running for God. Now that obstacle can be in the way. Now number six, the onlookers. Now we're running a race for God, but we have some onlookers. We're not just looking at ourselves. If we want to look at ourselves, it'd be different. Out there in California, there'll be people watching those racers and boxers and swimmers and people jumping and so forth out there from all over the world. People be looking at them from all over the world, and they know that, and they're going to do their best. And did you know we have some onlookers? We certainly do. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we are comforted by so great a cloud of witnesses, who are these onlookers? Well, I don't know, maybe a lot of people in heaven. I know a lot of people on the earth. That's old Abraham. He says, keep on moving on. I was a pilgrim one time and made the journey. 
That's old Mo Moses' concern. Moses said, I chose to suffer with God's people that uh, might uh, be rewarded instead of the, uh, take on the riches and wealth of Egypt. That's Daniel. Daniel said, I refuse to stop praying and went ahead and prayed and ended up in the lion's den. That's old Edith said, I walked with God in spite of the devil. That's Paul said, I spent years in a cold prison. These people could be looking on, saying, keep moving on. We did it, keep moving on. That's your loved ones in heaven, they're concerned. That's your families on the earth, they're concerned. Other Christians are concerned. The devil will be sure is concerned. And our Lord and the angels, they're very much concerned. So we are running a race and we got a lot of people watching us. Have you sat down with the racetrack and pouted about it? Somebody hurts your feelings, you've got to just quit and sit down and stop. That's what the devil wants. He'll laugh along with you about that. And it grieves God. God wants you to keep going regardless of what comes your way. And then there's the object of the race in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, our and finish my faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despite the shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's an object. You want to make the end of the race well because you're going to see Jesus at the end of the journey. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11 6, our faith is impossible to please him. And God wants us to keep our eyes on the goal. We're running for the goal. And we will see Jesus at the end of life's journey. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 4, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Run for the goal. Jesus is the end of the way, waiting for you. And he wants to give you the goal, and he will. Number eight, the outcome of the race. According to the scripture, to be joy throughout eternity. You'll be so glad you did. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's the rapture Paul is talking about. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy except unto God, which is your reasonable service. God wants us to keep on keeping on. We find that Daniel, Demas rather, loved the, pleasant, the present world and he went back home and gave up. We find that Samson, he lost out. We find that Lot became somewhat of a castaway. But we find others that kept on keeping on for God. Now run for the goal. While they're running in California for a, a temporal thing or a fair uh, in Mellis and so forth, you run for eternal things. You're on the greatest racetrack. You're running the greatest Olympic, and you need to run it to the glory of God. And when you come to the end of this journey, it's not going to end in a week or a month for everybody. It might for some, but you'll get your goal at the end of the life's journey. Keep on running for the goal that's ahead. Let me give you this in closing. The French Emperor Napoleon one day reviewed his troops when his horse bolted out of control. He was in danger of being hurled to the ground. So a young private leaped from the ranks and quickly calmed the animal. Thank you, Captain, said Napoleon, thus bestowing upon the private an instant promotion. Smiling proudly, the soldier inquired, of what regiment, sir? Of my guards, replied Napoleon, as he dashed down the line. Immediately assuming the new rank, the private turned captain, walked over to join a group of staff officers. What is this insolent fellow doing here, remarked one of them. I'm a captain of the guard, the young man replied. You rascal, you're just a private. What made you think you're a captain? At that, the young man pointed to the emperor and confidently responded, he said it. I beg your pardon, captain, said the officer, answering politely. I was not aware of your promotion. That young soldier did not feel like a captain, nor did he wear the insignia of a captain. All he had was the word of Napoleon, then that was enough. Now, beloved, regardless of how much talent you have, how much ability, how you look, how well trained you may be, you got the word of the captain, and he's, he's made you, you got the word of the general, he's made you a captain, and he wants you to run. And every person in this building and listen to me today can run for God, and the only one can hinder you will be you yourself. And don't be so foolish to let anybody hinder you or hinder yourself. Keep on moving for God because these are individual goals given out at the end of the journey and you want to get one in full. God bless you. Listen well. Let's stand to our feet. Our Father, I pray that you'll help us run the race well. Lord, we're on the track. We're not in California running for temporary honor or things that perish or fade away. But dear God, we're on eternal racetrack. 
running for the pure gold, running for our master. Lord, help us to run well. Take this message and use it to bless and help thy people. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, while Debbie plays an invitation number for us, there may be somebody here today that'd like to get saved. Maybe someone that's kind of off the track and you'd like to get back on the racetrack. Maybe someone would like to join this church. Or maybe God's prompting you to move forward for some reason I haven't mentioned. Would you come while she plays for us? The way is open. The door is open. You may come. Would you do it? That's it. That's all you need. Come forward if you feel like it. 